Thank you for tuning in to the Practical Preservation Podcast. Please take a moment to visit our website, practicalpreservationservices.com, for additional information and tips to help you restore your historical home. If you've not done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, and also like us on Facebook. Welcome to the Practical Preservation Podcast, hosted by Danielle and Jonathan Kepperling. Kepperling Preservation Services is a family-owned business based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, dedicated to the preservation of our built architectural history for today's use as well as future generations. Our weekly podcast provides you with expert advice specific to the unique needs of renovating a historic home, educating by sharing our From the Trenches preservation knowledge and our guests' expertise, balancing modern needs while maintaining the historical significance, character, and beauty of your period home. Today on the Practical Preservation Podcast, we have um, Dr. Lori with us. Uh, Dr. Lori is the star antiques appraiser on the History Channel's number one rated TV show, The Curse of Oak Island, Discovery Channel's Auction Kings, and she appears on Fox News, or Fox Business Network, Strange Inheritance. Dr. Lori has shared her expertise with Business Insider, NBC's to TV's Today Show, Anderson Live, Comedy Central's The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, NBC's TV, The Tonight Show, Inside Edition, and Lifetime Television. Dr. Lori is an award-winning TV pers- personality and TV talk show host with the PhD in Art History. PhD Antiques Appraiser, Dr. Lori Vanderdyne, is that, am I close? Murder for, oh, I wasn't close at all. <laughs> That's why I'm Dr. Lori. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is an internationally syndicated columnist and an author of with 30 books to her credit. She has contributed a blog to Lifetime Television and has been an editor of several lifestyle magazines. Dr. Lori is the director of www.drlorev.com, presenting at over at more than 150. 50 events every year conducting an in-home appraisal visits and appraisals online. Dr. Lori reviews approximately 20,000 items a year. So thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I'm fine. So we, um, we met. Long recently. list of stuff, right? Yes, That's how old yes. I am, how much I've been doing. <laughs> You're very, busy. very busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, we met briefly, actually, you, um, you had appraised a uh, pocket watch that my husband had gotten from his grandfather. So Great. I, I thought about reaching out to you to talk to you for the, for the podcast. And so thank you for joining us. I'm happy to join you. And, you know, we all love historic items, historic preservation, the interest in, of course, keeping items intact and pure, as well as architecture. It's really, it's something I love and I've been lucky, lucky to devote my uh, life to. Yes, very, very good. Thank you. Um, So talk talk to us a little bit about how did you start your business? Was there anything particular that led you to antiques? My father led me to antiques. (laughs) And That's how I thought preservation. Really, you know, my, I, yeah, I mean, it's funny because my, um, my parents were uh, much older than many of the parents of my friends. My father served in World War II. So basically, you know, most of my friends' parents maybe served in Vietnam or were now in their 70s. My parents are in their 90s. So right. that became where a young person, I was the youngest of all the kids, where a young person was around all old people and old things. <laughs> and my father was a great flea marketer, yard sailor, collector. He loved everything. So he loved objects. And my favorite place, as I've said many times, is my father's garage. He kept all this stuff there that my mother wouldn't let him bring upstairs into the house. (laughs) um, That's how it started. I did love history. I thought art history is very interesting. And I came from a museum background. So I worked in major museums as a, you know, as a master's student, as a PhD student. Um, But we didn't grow up with much wealth, so it's not like we had beautiful paintings around the house or anything. We just basically, um, I was able to be exposed through education to, in fact, art, antiques, collectibles, and the history that goes along with it. I had really good teachers, Danielle, you know, people who would say, think about history not as dates and battles. And I I try to think of history as the study of people and art 
facts are just the study of the stuff that they made. Yes. So and a reflection. It's easy yeah. to teach that. I'm sorry. I was thinking and art as a reflection of them, you know, yes. more so than, than just dates on a page. Yeah, so it became really easy for me to basically say, well, there's this person living at this time period and he needs this object or he wants to make that object. All of a sudden, that art comes alive. So yes. people will oftentimes be very courteous and sweet to me and say, God, Dr. Lori, you know, you made that come alive. Well, I try to bring out the people. So mm -hmm. an object that's inanimate that can't talk and I hope to talk for the object. Um, I have a lot of fun, and yes, I evaluate 20,000 objects a year, in-home appraisal sessions, my YouTube channel, which is tremendously popular, thank goodness, um, where we highlight my events where the public can bring objects in and get a free appraisal. So it's, it's a lot of fun, and that's how I got started. And then my parents who didn't go to college said, go to college, keep learning, keep learning. So um, that, with a little bit of athleticism, um, I <laughs> to school on athletic scholarships as well as academic scholarships when I was thin, you know. <laughs> um, they, in fact, helped me to go through a lot of education. So I have degrees from the University of Michigan and Wesleyan University in my home state of Connecticut. My PhD is from the great Penn State. Okay, very, very good. So you, 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 were, you were encouraged and you wanted to bring out the stories of the objects rather than rather than just th this is something that is here and it's, you know, it, it actually has a story behind it. Yeah, and like many of your listeners uh, and, and viewers, it's very commonplace that people would have their best hobbies in like the, the worst place in the house. So my father's garage was this great place where he also did his woodworking hobby. He loved Eric Sloan and he loved American Barnes. Oh, so yes. He would actually make little odd things with barn wood. So <laughs> sort of this place where old and new met. It was yes. kind of place to, to grow up and I grew up in uh, in, in southern New England okay there, and there's there's a, t a lot of history there so is there yeah. a certain time period or type of antique that you focus on or well as I said my dad was a World War II veteran so many of my books are on post-war American art mm -hmm. and particularly um, American art of the 19th and 20th centuries, and also post-war, post-World War II. So while many of my books are about art, antiques, collectibles, um, you'll also see sort of what they might call my research area is American art. And that, that mid-century modern era is, is, is fun. It, it, yeah. uh, they were really pushing boundaries. Uh, That's from a, right. Yeah, from a preservation standpoint, it's really hard because the materials they used weren't able to be restored. Or, exactly. or easily restored. But, or but, easily but, restored, yeah. that's right. Sometimes they say an 18th century piece is a little bit easier than a 1960s piece. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really true because yeah. innovations, of course, in innovations in materials or what we might call technological innovations actually hurt us when it comes to restoration. It's very difficult to do what a, a professional restorer does. Um, right. Actually know all of those different time periods. So people say, well, what's your, what's your specialty? Well, yeah, you know, everybody seems to have a specialty, but I don't only get one thing to come in. When you evaluate as many objects as I do, and if you had to teach at the university level like I did or work in major museums like the Yale Art Gallery, the Allentown Art Museum, I've lectured at the Louvre, the Uffizi, the, the, in St. Petersburg at the Hermitage, you have to know all of these time periods and you have right. to, to identify all of these objects. So now I've done it a long time. <laughs> you know, and lots of books and lots of tests and lots of jumping through hoops to get all these degrees. But again, it's true that the, the, ninth, the, the American century or the 20th century, you know, the 1900s in America is really an interesting time period. But you know what? I've seen so many wonderful objects, um, mascara jars from 60 BC. Oh from, my goodness. That, you know, Cleopatra could have used, you know, and um, you know, uh, George Washington's wallet or um, Napoleon, you know, uh, what they say is that a part of the, the flesh of Napoleon, I mean, I've seen all kinds of stuff. Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, and, and it doesn't really matter what it is, you know, a, a prosthetic leg from the Civil War, you know, oh, I mean, yeah. kinds of objects because people have all kinds of needs. Um, it doesn't really matter what the object is. There's a great story behind it. And I can teach you something from the junk. You know, right. it doesn't have to be valuable, to be fun and interesting. Well, and it, it, it does teach you about the people who thought to save that. That's right. That's right.
Yeah. You know, you imagine, you know, great, great grandpa Joe, you know, and he lost his leg in the Civil War while his prosthetic leg is in the attic for another hundred years. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. The, the things that uh, they, they, they um, did a um, game at my bridal shower almost 20 years ago now that was what's in your purse. And it was like the weirdest things in your purse. Well, my, 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 um, husband to be at that time his grandmother had the receipt from her mother's funeral in her purse she won the award oh. <laughs> but see so then, yeah. you know this is the kind of stuff and you know it's interesting what people will bring to me that they wouldn't bring to somebody else right. because you know, people who watch me and know me follow me around the country to my my public events or have seen me on television and they say, you know what, Dr. Lori's a girl. She's our friend. She's going to help us. I'm just going to bring it to Dr. Lori and she'll just shoot straight with me. So right. people have realized it doesn't have to be precious and wonderful and mice and gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's nice. I'll appraise it, but I'll also appraise the stuff that, you know, maybe if your grandmother was like my grandmother who didn't come from particular wealth, that was just always on the countertop, but means something to you. Right. So yeah. I'll tell you about that too. And there's, there's a wonderful history to all of that. It doesn't have to be a million dollar piece or warrants being in a museum to be an interesting thing. Yes, yes. So you I'm everybody's appraiser is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you recommend on your website getting an independent appraisal. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, this is where I get serious and people say, uh oh, you know, but but this is the thing. Um, I started this career after a happy career, university professor, museum curator, museum director, and I met a 75-year-old woman who sold a $50,000 document to an appraiser who offered her $50. <gasps> so I'm sitting there saying, oh, my mother would do this. My mother would think, oh, 50 bucks, good. I could play the electric bill this month. Right. Yeah. I don't need that, whatever that thing is, whatever that object is. An appraiser should not, in my opinion, also be someone who wants to buy your object. Right. Appraising your object, they need to appraise only. Yeah. If they're appraising your object, oh, it's not worth that much because they know it's worth a lot, and then they make you a purchase offer, they're no longer an appraiser, in my opinion. Right. There are many appraisers who are working in the field who are actually doing all different things. They're buying, they're selling, they're just appraising, they're brokering, they're doing all this stuff. I think you need an unbiased ind independent appraisal, right? Well, they'll say, oh, I'll give you the appraisal for free, but you know what? You get what you pay for. Right. If they say you're getting the appraisal for free. You're not getting it for free. The minute that you sell that piece to that person, guess what? You lost money. You paid for that. Yeah. So that, those appraisals are worthless. You have to have an unbiased appraisal, and you have to have it from someone with my credentials. People say, well, not everybody has your credentials. Well, I didn't just walk through those three degrees. I had to earn those three degrees. Right. I didn't just walk through looking at all these objects. I've been running around the country for 20, 22 years. Right. Teaching people, learning from people, and you know, keeping track of everything and researching everything. So basically what I want you to people to understand is look, if you want to get somebody to buy your object that's different from someone who's going to tell you the true value and show you where the markets are. Right. I show people here's where a similar piece is sold. You get the appraisal, you see where another one sold, and then go off and negotiate with anybody. Right. You get your best deal that way. And that, that's what I'm after. I'm after you getting your best deal if you want to sell your piece. And if you don't want to sell your piece, I want you to know the background of the piece. I want you to know what your family history was like. I have actually had pieces come to me that families have said, I know that's from my grandmother in California. I know that's from my grandmother in California. And I look at the piece and I say, is anybody from Baltimore? Because this is a piece of Ray Pousset silver and it was made in Baltimore. Right. Oh yeah, my other grandmother was from Baltimore. And all <laughs> the family history goes right. aside because they don't realize that this particular piece actually is telling you something. Yeah. So it's good to have a true expert and not someone who just looks like an expert, somebody who has the credentials to back it up. That and and I I think ethically you know there's a definite conflict of interest if you're going thank to, you if you're going right. to offer to buy something that you've appraised and and right. and you're not going to tell the true value because here's here's an example that relates to you you and I met over a let's call it a, about a two thousand dollar pocket watch right. right I knew what that pocket watch immediately you didn't have to even open your mouth I knew what it was I knew what it was worth I knew the whole deal I knew the markets for it. Before you even say anything, once I see that object. Okay. 
an unethical appraiser, which is not me, right? right. Unethical appraiser, what it might have said, oh, I'll give you 200 bucks. And typically what they offer you is 10%. I'll give you $200 for it. Right. Dollars, really? Wow, $200. You don't know anything about it. You have no idea how much it's really worth, right? So then what ends up happening is you might have taken that $200 without any more information. That's the reason. When you have a real life example, then you start to understand. Right, yeah, definitely. It has a lot on you. They know things. So you want to be careful. You want someone unbiased. And you want to pay those people, that appraiser, for their service. Right. For them being yeah. ethical, yeah. you know. Don't let them make money on you on the other end because the, the fee is so small compared to how much money they can make off your object. Yeah. It's the same thing that we tell people about the free energy audit. You, you don't, it, whoever's offering you a free energy audit on the back end is going to be selling you windows or whatever, whatever their audit is going to prescribe for you. So it's the same idea. You right. Know? <laughs> right. I see. No, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So really, you've got to think about that because yeah. really you paid for that energy audit. That was yes. free, right. Yes. Yeah. You paid yeah. for it in too much money paid for your windows, for example. Right. Or, I, or any, yeah, or, you know, any, you know, they'll, you know, they, they, their prescription, they're already going in knowing what they're going to tell you you need. Right. And so, yeah, well, it's the same, I think it's the yeah. same idea. You, you have to pay for a service. Doesn't, you should pay for it. It doesn't, it shouldn't be. Free. It's the same yeah. idea, yeah. but what ends up happening is I am literally with my background, the only one who does it this way. Oh, so people, yeah. Then they say, well, I can't get to her. You can't get to me. You can get to me. You can right. get to me on the cell phone. You can get to me at a public event. You can see me in person. I'm all over the internet. I'm all over television. Yes. You have no reason why you can't get to me at drlaurieV.com. You have no reason why you can't get a true, honest, ethical, intelligent appraisal from me. No reason. No, so, sir, I agree. Because I, mean, I do so many of them because yeah. I really want people to get it. You know, I meet the millennials who are trying to decorate with antiques their, their new apartments because they yes. love something vintage. Um, I have, you know, the 95-year-olds who are like, oh, we've had this with my family centuries and centuries back. So everybody can get to me and I will tell you what you've got, tell you what it's really worth. Yes, that's that's a that's a very valuable service. So you are very accessible, and you are on a lot of different media outlets. You know yeah. your your television appearances, your syndicated columns, you know your YouTube channel. What are you trying to just reach more people? Is that your is that your goal with that? Or well, I've been very fortunate because <clears throat> most of the, when people see me, whether it's folks like you running podcasts or. Um, you know, television producers or Hollywood or whatever it is, they say, you know what, we want her. And I'm lucky in that. Um, so, but people also understand that I can basically explain and make you excited and give you the history of all of it. Uh, the Curse of Oak Island is a very good example. The show traces its 223 year long treasure hunt on Oak Island, Nova Scotia, and they needed an artifact expert. And um, basically, you know, they dig something up and nobody would know what it was. And they'd have people who were guessing, right. but they had to stop the guessing. So that's when they, they called me in. So we've found some wonderful pieces on Oak Island and they continue their treasure hunt there. And um, other shows which have been very popular, like Auction Kings or Strange Inheritance or any of the news outlets, you know, where I'm talking to Anderson Cooper, or I'm talking to the folks at Fox um, for many, many years. So yes. I think they appreciate, I'm honest, I'm ethical, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'll break some hearts, but right. I'm millionaires. I mean, I'm just yeah. going to tell you this is what it is. And, um, you know, I've seen wonderful objects, and I've heard great stories. Um, the film, uh, so a woman comes in, and she has the actual film and film camera from one of the um, people who are in the Enola Gay who are going to drop the bomb. Oh, yes. Um, on Hiroshima in, during World War II. And she's the daughter of one of the pilots. And she said, well, my father brought home the camera with all the pictures. <laughs> or, I mean, or this has been in our attic for years and years and years. Or this has been in the basement. Or I was out with my metal detector and I found this, Dr. Lori. I have that a lot too. So it comes from all different places. But most of the time people want to know, how do I preserve it? Yeah. What you do all day, every day, preservation. Yeah. You know, how do I identify it? How can I learn more? You know, so you want someone who's trained in research like me. Mm -hmm. How do I learn more? You've told yes. me a lot, but how do I learn more? And what's the real value? 
what's truly the value if I want to know in all markets globally? Because now with the beauty of the internet, we can actually hit all markets globally. Right. So we can do that through our smartphones. So we really have the opportunity, if you have a Mickey Mouse collectible that Mario in Milan has to have, you can get to Mario. Right. Yeah. So my appraisals help you with all those types of things. But um, really the fun of it is being around the objects and being able to impart the history. Yes. Well, and, and I know that with the internet, the antiques market really changed because things that were thought to be very rare were found to be less rare. I'm sure that impacted your work then too. Well, that impacts everybody's work. Now, remember, you know, as an appraiser, what ends up happening is you have a lot of people who, when you go to search on the internet, you get incorrect information. Right. I spend a lot of time correcting other appraisers or correcting other people who think they know because they found something online. So they find something when they Google it or they Yahoo it or they, you know, Bing it. Yeah. Basically, they find out, oh, I think it's that, and then they bring it to me and I go, it's not that because of all this other criteria, because the source, people will go to a website and assume it's correct. Right. Just because somebody put up a website. Well, who are those people? And what is their background? And then people's heads start to pop off. They go, oh no, Dr. Lorraine, I didn't even think of that. I don't know who that guy was who told me. Right. <laughs> You know, he could be your friend Louie in the 7-Eleven who's just getting coffee with you who knows antiques. Right. Doesn't always happen, you know. Um, so you really have to know your source. And that's why, you know, DrLaurieV.com, people know it as a research tool and they can use it. Um, just like a lot of folks who are experts in your field, they do it all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and that, is that experience and every, every... Every job, I learn something new. So, you know, you're always learning. You're always, so, and the more, the more things you do, the more you learn. That's right. And you have to be a special type of expert to want to keep learning. Right. That's true. Yeah. Right. Because there are a lot of folks who go, I know how to do what my job is and I do the same thing all the time. That's great. But the person who solves a problem and then continues to learn from the next appraisal, the next project, the next job right. is really the expert you want because they love it. You yes. know, you can't, when you meet me, you, I mean, you've met me, so you can't, you cannot deny that I love it. I right. love it bad. <laughs> you know, I was like, it's really what I do. Yes. And um, people get excited by that because, you know, in your family, it might have been, oh, why does Susie care about that old jar? Nobody cares about that old jar, but Susie cares about that old right. jar, you know? So I want those people to come out and to enjoy the research process, really. Yes. yes. It's like a treasure hunt. It is. It is. So do you, are there common mistakes that you see people make with their antiques or do you have any tips that people can avoid, you know, avoid making? That's a really good question. The biggest myth and the biggest tip I have is don't assume just because something's yours that it is not valuable. Mm. Everybody wants you to believe you don't have anything valuable. You're not the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, the wealthy. Right. True. I have seen some of the best pieces, some of the most fascinating pieces and most valuable pieces in places where you would think, wow, this is really not a place where anything good will possibly be living. Right. Yeah. Oftentimes true. And people will say, oh, it's only in the big cities. Not true. You know, it could be in the big cities, but it could also be in rural areas um, where people take care of their stuff and don't trade stuff a lot. Right. Where they, it's just been passed down. Right. Yeah. Just been passed down and condition. They cared for what few things they had. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. Um, so that's the biggest myth, assuming it's always somebody else who has something valuable. Right. Um, thinking that everything on the internet is accurate. Not true. Right. I had things about myself written that are wrong. You know, my Wikipedia page was changed to say that I was a sports medicine doctor. <laughs> You tell me. I mean, I'm looking at Wikipedia, and right. I know we have done the Wikipedia page years ago, and I'm going, so somebody went in there and confused me. Right. And said I was sports medicine. Okay. I mean, the stuff that's in inaccurate is really problematic. So yes. you got to get a real expert who knows. And that's where really we should be moving with technology toward who is the source. Right. So that's one of the things I think people should be careful of. Try not to be overzealous cleaning. I grew up in an Italian Catholic family. My mother was immaculate. That house was clean. <laughs> and I say that because she doesn't like it when I say, be a little dirty. Don't clean, clean, clean everything. Right. 
if so you can damage, it, yeah, you can do damage. So use a white cotton cloth. Try not to use commercial cleaners. Try not to submerge things into water. You can do damage. So leave it alone. Try to get surface dust off, okay, but for the most part, don't be overzealous cleaning, scraping, scrubbing, because you can do more damage. Right. There was actually, we had a spring cleaning tip and somebody had emailed me back and asked me why, and I didn't know the answer. Is there a reason that you shouldn't use feather dusters? Is it the oils from the feathers or? Usually oils from the feather dusters and other commercial cleaners and some of those other treated um, pieces of cloth or textile can actually leave residue. You want to be aware of that. Um, you just want to be careful and not overzealous cleaning. I'm not saying keep everything, you know, terribly dirty with mud on it. Right. I'm saying you want to think about not being overzealous. So don't clean, clean, clean. I always say, you know, there's certain, there are lots of tips on drlauriev.com about how to do preservation of certain objects. There are, there are some good books out there, particularly the one from the Smithsonian about how to preserve pieces um, from their conservators. Um, because it becomes relatively important. The other thing you want to think about with respect to objects is how to display them. You want to be careful of um, china closets. You want to open them up, let some of the heat escape. Oh, Don't yeah. Worry. Everybody worries about dust and dirt in china closets, but you really want to let some of the heat escape. And I always say, this is the thing my, my grandmother used to do when she was actually sitting making an Italian dish called brajol. I don't know if you know, but you've actually put all these different spices in this, in this flattened meat and you roll it up and you put it in tomato sauce. And she would always sit. And she used to say, most people stand when they cook. Right. She would always sit. And, and it was funny because we would think, well, why are you sitting? And she said, you can concentrate better if you're sitting. And I found that it was interesting that we study when we, we sit when we study, we sit when we read, we sit. And when we clean an object, an art antique or collectible, it's a good idea to sit. Don't do it when you're tired. Don't do it as an aside. Make it a right. project. And that way you'll have less apt to drop it. You'll have less apt to damage it. You'll take your time. Yeah. Um, so it has to be done not as an aside, but these objects have to take sort of first priority. Mm -hmm. um, so I like white cotton cloths, as most conservators do. You you all know me because I wear my white gloves almost all the time. I don't yeah. touch objects without them. And other appraisers who do touch objects without protecting their hands from your objects are not experts. So when you see any of these people on any of these TV shows and they're just handling objects or pointing to them with sharp sticks or any of that, it's a problem. Right, and you could so, damage. Yeah, museum professionals do not touch objects without wearing the gloves, because the oils on our hands can be transferred to an object, attract dirt, and deteriorate the object. Right. And that comes from my years in museums, where they would say, oh, Lori, you know, you're going into storage at the Gale Art Gallery, here are your gloves, be careful what you touch, and make sure that, you know, you're holding things from a base, and you're supporting it with your other hand. Yes. And don't carry five things at once. <laughs> Yeah, you know, don't have your Picasso under one arm and, you know, your Renoir sculpture under another arm. And so you won't really want to think about that. But preservation is really important. And you're not only preserving it for you or for the value, you're preserving it for other generations to learn about. You. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is really, you know, the, the, our best clients are people who view them themselves as stewards of the home, that they're, they're only going to be here for a period of time. And uh, that's right. That's right. And it is important because you are representing now a time and a place, a culture to those who come after you. Right. Yes. Yeah. So do you have, you've shared a lot, but do you have any other advice or tips for, for our, our listeners? I, I always say, love it. Just love it. You know, um, enjoy the pieces, love it, display them proudly in your home, talk about them um, as conversation pieces, bring them up, curios, you know, people will come back to my events and say, oh, Dr. Larry, you praised something for me five years ago or 10 years ago, and wow, it's really a wonderful thing, and every, every Thanksgiving, we talk about it, because yes. it was grandma's painting, and mm -hmm. we were, so I have a little piece of me in a lot of people's homes all over the United States, yeah. because I praise something for them, and um, it, it's really interesting, because their curiosities, you know, curio cabinets, curiosity shops, actually started from this idea that we were curious about other places. So you'll see oh, I travel a lot. 
because we're curious about other places. So what we want to do is have that conversation. So I just hope you have a lot of conversation pieces and you use those objects as a starting point to learn about others. But appraisals are very important because we need to know the value so we can, I don't know if you have to flip something to educate a child or to pay for health care or whatever it might be. Right. These really are important and they really can be the savior in a lot of ways. And if they're not worth a lot, they also are oftentimes really interesting in terms of their historic background. Yes, yes, yes. So preserving them is key. Yes, yes. Sorry, yes. preserving them is key. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And 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 that sometimes it's the day-to-day -day things that are more interesting than like the, the big museum pieces. Yeah, so, we, so like for example, you know, you think of a Greek vase, you think, oh, it's a Greek vase. Well, in five, in the fifth century BC, a Greek vase was like our Tupperware. Right. Yeah, that's what it was. It was just storage, basically. Yeah. So we think, ooh, it's a Greek vase. Well, it tells us a lot about the Greeks, you know, of the ancient world. But basically, it's Tupperware. Right. And they oh, wow, how did she just do that? But now, all of a sudden, that Greek vase means something to you. Right. Because yeah. now it's part of how it, it is revealed as how it's part of your life. Yes, it's yeah. just a museum thing that you don't really know what it is or understand it. Yeah. Now it's very easy. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it makes the connections. And I think those connections are what make people want to then preserve and, and retain these things. Right, exactly, exactly. So I've had a lot of fun. I've been fortunate, but I had a lot of fun. I've met wonderful people like you, and I've heard their great stories of history through objects. And as for appraisals, you know, we have a lot of fun, a lot of laughs at my public events. And I try to give many different options in terms of services for our appraisals. So you can always find out from the authority in the country, that's me, what, you, <laughs> what it's really worth. Okay, very good. So how could someone contact you? Should they go to your website? They can start with our website, okay. sure. DrLurieV.com. Okay, v and I'll make sure that's on our site too. Thank you. And um, basically, I'll ask, you can go right to our website if you want to send a photo of your object um, for an online appraisal, you can do that. I'll look at all of them myself. I look at them. And um, we'll, I'll get back to you with, this is what it is. Oh, it's not worth it. Oh, it is. Whatever. And um, you can start there. If you just have a question, you can go to the website, just ask a question. I get back to all those as well. And our YouTube channel is great. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel at YouTube, Dr. Lori V., and you can watch the appraisals as they happen live, and you can watch all of our videos on the website as well as at YouTube. But it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, and you'd be surprised at some of the things that uh, I, I encounter, and you'd be surprised at some of the values too. Yes, okay, very good. Did you have any um, thing that's coming up that you wanted to promote, any seminars hope, or appearances? I hope you'll go to our website at drlorivcom slash events, which okay. basically has all of our events, my events where I do public appraisals uh, free of charge out of all kinds of events all over the United States. So go there and hopefully I'll meet you in person. Okay, very good. I'll make sure that's on our site too so that people can go right there when they're listening. That's great. Okay. Keep doing all the good work that you're doing and thank oh, you. Thank you very much. During this episode are on our website at practicalpreservationservices.com forward slash podcast. If you received value from this episode and know someone else that will get value from it as well, please share it with them. Join us next week for another episode of the Practical Preservation Podcast. For more information on restoring your historic home, visit practicalpreservationservices.com.